right. I started it now. Sorry. Right. I'm not repeating everything. Go to the notes. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. No, this is I've really, done no, this is really helpful. I, I appreciate that. Um, so thanks for, for kind of taking a look at that. Um, and that's something that I, I will make a change. And I think the, at least the path forward on this and um, is working with Alice and Anna at the to-do group. And I think we're probably about maybe a month away from having this chapter done, but I'll make sure to share it again with the university group to make sure I'm, because I'd like to include, include you all, <laughs> at least in terms of thinking about OSPOs, that it's not just completely corporately centric. So, okay. Um, all right, another thing I would like to bring up is um, we, okay, so do you remember a few weeks back, we talked about how to, like a different scenario, a scenario of how you at your OSPO could necessarily support the research group? Do you remember this? discussion. I don't know if you were both here. And we talked through a couple of different scenarios. So you have a successful research group at a university. You know, how do you help ensure that that project can go on <laughs> beyond the funding cycle, basically, is, is kind of where we were at. So ways of an OSPO kind of helping researchers think through what open source means for their research project more than just you know putting a license on something and putting it on github and then just walking away kind of thing so what would be the the indicators by which um you could help a research group think about the sustainability what would be the things that you could potentially look at and so we had a really nice discussion um in that regard and it took most of the time so i i went back to that discussion and um kind of built a couple different things as a way to kind of capture that so that we didn't just have that discussion and then it just sits in the minutes. So there were two things that I kind of started. Um, so the first was um, what we call practitioner guides, and this is still very early kind of in the process. So a practitioner guide is a, something that Don, who's on this call, had put together as a way to help um, different folks think through how a series of metrics can support particular activities or particular ways of thinking about a project. Um, more than just a metric model, which is kind of just a collection of metrics, this is meant to really take a look at specific metrics and, and help people identify trends and do diagnosis. Um, and so what I did was through the discussion that we had a couple of weeks ago, I tried to identify what um, what were some published metrics that we have in chaos that kind of spoke to the discussion that we had a month ago. You know, so like how would we understand community work or this kind of this path towards sustainability around research projects? And there were a couple of metrics that that um kind of came up to me and so one was project engagement one was new contributors and one was it was actually downloads but we don't have a great metric for downloads and so i just moved to technical forks as kind of an indicator that people are maybe you know <laughs> whether it's through pull requests or, or actually forking this project for their own i think either could be a potential nice indicator and so just like these would be metrics as an example that you would bring to research groups and say, you know, why don't you take a look at, at the trends around project engagement? Why don't you take a look at the trends around new contributors? Why don't you take a look at the trends around technical forks as ways to think about um, the community work that you're doing with the intention of having this project, whatever it is, you know, be sustainable beyond funding cycles. So the general thought would be, you know, is if you're having strong project engagement, if you're continuing to get new contributors, and you have a lot of forking going on, maybe that's a good thing. It could be, you know what I mean? And that could be a, a nice indicator for you as a project to think about, um, or nice indicators for you as a project to know that your project may have some, some life beyond a funding cycle. 
So I just, I guess maybe what I'd like to do, again, we don't have too many people on this call, but just kind of get your sense of, I don't love this title, but um, like how these metrics, if these metrics you think could be nice indicators of activity <laughs> and movement towards sustainability for the research projects that, that you may be supporting in your OSPO. So Sean or Allison, or Michael, or Richard, you know, these, again, I pulled this from the conversation we had about a month ago. No. My first main thought here is that yeah. this is budding really closely into Reza territory. And that this title doesn't necessarily t tell us much. No, the um, title, I already said the title's terrible. <laughs> I admit it. <that>. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think it's okay if we, you're talking about the software, the research software alliance stuff. Well, it's just, yeah, but into it maybe Miss Race. Like Risa does awesome work. They're really, really cool. And a lot of the times some well, some of the times that work is also open source work, right? Risha yeah. software is kind of vaguely similar to open source software in academia. Um so I just just looking at this at a first glance and, and thinking about it, I'm like, okay, this is gonna be about research software. Um, but that's not necessarily the point you're going for. No, it's about how to think about the community around that software that you can build community that could potentially help with sustainability or as we talked about a month ago too that these indicators actually tell you maybe you should be sunsetting this project <laughs> like we're seeing low levels of engagement not a lot of newcomers coming in uh, not a lot of forking occurring on the project i'm being very extreme here but because sunsetting came up a lot but not every yes, i would want a Go ahead. Sorry, um, I hear you. I, so I guess what I would like to see in a document that covers that then is a much better definition of community. Um, I know we like hammer that to death all the time. Um, I got to be less violent death metaphor. I'm not cogent right now. Um, but in general, like community for research stuff is just a totally different word than most open source projects. And that's the thing that you're going to have to talk about the most. Agreed um what's on your mind there i know it's only in the fours <laughs> so <laughs> uh well a research project that has no contributors for five years might be an active healthy project agreed in research yes um, and so so i think with respect to the practitioner guides to that point yeah it would be like these are the metrics you could take a look at and here's how you might think about them in context. So we could say, even though you're seeing not a lot of new contributors over time, understand that that might be an okay thing. Yeah. So this is in the practitioner guides that Don put together, a lot of the narrative is built into these step ones and step twos, not just the metrics and then walk away. Yeah, and there's also an introduction guide that goes along with all the practitioner guides, which talks about um, how you have to interpret this in light of the goals of the project and what the project looks like. Because like you said, there might be some projects that don't really have any community or activity that are that are fine. I mean, if you've, if you've implemented a bunch of mathematical libraries that do a certain thing, those don't change a lot. Um, and if you aren't, you know, if they don't have a lot of dependencies then they probably don't have security updates. And so there's probably not a lot to do on that project, but that doesn't mean it's not healthy. So I think, um, yeah, it's hard to talk about one of these practitioner guides kind of in in isolation, isolation. I guess, because uh, we do expect people to read kind of that introduction guide, which talks about some of that. And then the real magic in these guides is not in these first couple of steps. It's in the make improvements step later on, which talks about how to how to make changes that you might need to make in your research project to make it more whatever sustainable or something more community oriented.
feel like I killed the conversation. No, you didn't. I was no, just no, no, yeah, people was trying to no, no. wait a go on. It was so thought provoking that. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I was doing. I was thinking, um, I think so far in my short amount of time, I've been in this role, like when I, when I talk to faculty who have research projects that are open source or they, you know, want to make them open source when they talk about community I feel like they're mostly talking about the user community the potential people that they that their project will have a positive impact on. Okay. And they don't necessarily they're not thinking about a contributor community as much it's just like here's this here's this output we want it to be open so other universities can make the same impact in their local community that we did with this project, rather than we are trying to keep this project alive by like attracting contributors to it and making changes and updates to it for better or worse. Have they talked about how they understand their user community? So, yeah, they, um, in, in the situations I've been in, they've been, you know, working on a research project and then you know, the software is sort of a result of that, an output of their findings, um, a solution to the challenge that they identified. Yep. And so how do they know, excuse me, how do they know that people are using the output of that? Um, this, the most recent one I'm thinking of um, hasn't really gotten to the point of sending it out. They consulted me on what they need to do before they can, you know, make package it up and make it a thing like it, it was just like a little project it's like how do we how do we turn this into something that can be yeah. easily replicated in places with few resources um things like that but they were not necessarily thinking about upstream contributions um back to the project in terms of that community which maybe they should be <laughs> but yeah <coughs> I'm just thinking like, so in, as an example, like Sean has the Augur software mm -hmm. you know, as part of it, which kind of stems from research funding. Um, and, but it's, it's difficult, Sean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's difficult for Sean to know like who's actually using the Augur. Mm -hmm. Like he can, there are consulting things that he can do and he obviously knows. Yeah. But, like I, yeah. I know who logs I know who logs into the public instance and I know how many unique users there are. But I don't there are a lot more unique users than there are people who log in. Right. So yeah, I don't know who they are. I mean they were planning on doing some follow up research, you know, to measure, you know, the if the project did what it was supposed to do in terms of solving the issue and you know conducting some follow-up opinion surveying um but in terms of like the actual here fork this for your own community so you yeah. can use it um i guess it would they would just rely on the communication they get from those people yeah. any inquiries about using the project um the forks that actually happen if someone does was... fork it Things that like was that. the closest I got here with technical force because yeah. the mm -hmm. discussion we had downloads, which is kind of a user community. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like we can't. It's such an impossible thing to track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so tech yeah. and from... and stars stars is a another one. I don't like it from a health perspective, but um, it it is correlated to usage. That's what Sophia and Georg have found in their the MSR paper that they just mm. that they recently did which hasn't hasn't come out yet but okay so maybe just like these two could be indicators <laughs> like again understanding in context <laughs> but potential indicators of downstream use and these as indicators of like the community itself even though mm -hmm. to your point allison like maybe not a lot of people care about that right now <laughs> um but from a guide perspective, here are a couple oh, yeah. of ways that you can look at things. And I think there are people that are interested in building community around their projects and having that be part of it. It's just I, I haven't encountered that yet. Okay. Um, and I, Don, at least from your perspective too, from like you're thinking on um, the practitioner guides, like are are 
is the intention is is this kind of in line with your intention kind of a couple fairly straightforward things that you can look at and start making decisions around to be a little bit more proactive around the things that you want to be proactive on yeah and the guidance is uh two to four metrics Okay. Um, but there's an additional metrics section later. So if there are other metrics that you think would be would be useful, then um, that's in the uh, yeah. You stripped some stuff out of the template, I think. Um, no, I did. did. I was using template? an old, I was using an old one. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So so there's a section that goes into the gather additional data. I'll just I'll drop it into the into the thing. Um, this is part of the template. Okay. Um, yeah, so I dropped it, I dropped it in step, step three, because the idea is just pick, pick the top two to four, and then you can list, you know, another, however many that you think are also, also might be useful. Okay. Okay. But the um, idea is not, not to overwhelm them with all of the things up front. And yeah, make it things that you can, I mean, some of these you can see pretty easily, like that one, you know, just on a project. Yeah. And I'd be curious if, you know, thinking about, thinking about research software, um, are stars and forks good indicators of, of usage? I, I don't know. You know, I'm thinking in particular about the, like the R ecosystem, for example, or the Python ecosystem where lots of people use these things from from package managers and they don't even care that it's open source and so are That's... there more of those like you know we typically think of like the the stars and forks are indi indicative of usage for um, open source software like typical open source software projects um i don't know haven't the alt metrics people thought about that oh i'm sorry sean your hand is yellow. You're, Go ahead. No, you're fine. I was just gonna say. I mean, our our exists because it's open source and academics. We got tired of paying for statistical software, like paying through the nose. So we care, but we don't. Right? It's you're right that it's the package manager, and that's the only place we look. I've never gone and starred an R library that I used on GitHub ever, and I yeah. used to do R like tons of R early in my academic career. Like it was all R all the time. And I never, ever went to the GitHub side of it. Yeah, so I'm wondering if if when you're talking about research software, if there are better indicators of usage. And I think Richard, you were trying to say something too. Yeah, I was trying to say that like, I, I went on this little tiny thing in my head where I'm like, oh, I wonder if we can get academics to find another way of citing stuff that they use. And like starring stuff that they use, I'm like, no, let's not, let's not ever think about that. Um, but like the alt alt metrics people have done a lot of work on that. Um, I don't see a lot of them in this call. I just know alt metrics has been going for like 20 years, and so it might be worth bringing them in, um, or at least asking that community in the answer to that specific question of like, how do you find out? Okay. Who is this alt metrics community? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, mysterious to me. <laughs> it's in the library science yeah. space a lot. I, yeah. I used it quite a bit as a former scholarly communications librarian. It's just like alternative metrics of publications besides the traditional ones like impact factor, et cetera. So they, okay. they'll look at things like press releases, media, social media mentions, gotcha. um, things like that. Cool. So it's and coming they make from fun the other rainbow angle. donuts with all of the different ones in them, and they're pretty. And faculty like them because they look cool. And it's like, oh, people are talking about my work, <laughs> that kind of thing. But yeah, I haven't heard it mentioned as much in the context of anything but publishing. It's it's normally mentioned in the sense that like you you know you need to have other ways of showing yes. that a professional researcher is getting cited because citations are really bad. Um, and in the same vein, it could be applied to software in the sense that we need to find other ways of getting people yes. glory for their work, right? And so they don't have a, a computational angle normally. It's not like they're going around no. looking for people's software that's being researched. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if there might be some overlap. We, I think we have 
I'll have to look. But a metric that is like media mentions. We have which a popularity metric, which has, we've yeah. talked about whether Georg and I were just talking about, well, mostly Georg was asking if that really should be a metrics model because it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff. But um, as it's written right now, it's it has a lot of the stuff that that Allison was just mentioning, along with the typical open source stuff. So the popularity metric might be a better way to to look at usage. Mm -hmm. Although there's some discussion, like I said, about converting it into a metric model. Yeah, I would say in the academic world, uh, to your point in this discussion, there's it's a multi, multi, multiple data points have to be sort of triangulated with each other to 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 tell a story, because it it's not the same data points we use in corporate open source. Okay, well, this is a good conversation. Um, let me take let's see let me take a look at what some of those alt metrics could be I, I like this based on the conversation it seems like there's a spot for a guide here to help university aspos kind of work with researchers to think about the open source projects that they're looking to sustain for whatever reason um and kind of moving this into a practitioner guide could be a useful tool for people just there was such a great discussion. There seems like there's a need and trying to just capture that and not lose it. All right. And then um, I've been told my music can be heard in the background. So sorry about that. Um, it's good music, so it's fine. <laughs> it's just a, it's a radio station. It's the current yeah. in yeah. Minneapolis. So it's their public radio station that just. Um, and then. Okay, so then what I also did, and I will keep these aligned, is um, this is a blog post that kind of came from that discussion as well. It's, it's terrible. Oh my God, do not read this. But I'm just trying to capture the conversation that came out of that. I just want you to all know, you know, I just was typing things. Um, and this would, lots of times when, if we do a practitioner guide, oftentimes we have a blog post that goes with it that says, hey, we have this practitioner guide, here's why it's useful to you, you know, maybe something that you might want to check out as a reader of, and then we promote the blog post to kind of bring people to that guide. So I just wanted to let you know that both of those things are kind of happening here. Do not need feedback <laughs> on that because it's so terrible that <laughs> feedback is not appreciated at this point. <laughs> so, um, all right. So let's see a few things before we wrap up here. Um, Allison, I, I, we had talked about maybe a workshop at Madison. I don't know if you have anything on that. Yeah. Um, so one thing I've been thinking about there is we also just did this workshop at Vermont with um, Curios and I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, how that might overlap in terms of doing a pose workshop as well. But well, I would love I to would, host a workshop of some kind. I'd, I'd be all about going to Madison. My, my daughter's in school there, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun place full of flamingos. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so the idea was to try to, I think, bring people together. It would be nice, I think, to run a workshop potentially just curious, I think, is a tighter group of people. And if we could kind of open up a workshop that anybody with an interest in open source. Sure. University level could show up to. That'd be so great. So then potentially we would be making the audience bigger. I remember in the beginning yeah. it was going to be like 15 to 20. But I think if we want to open it up, then we would need more. Yeah. More and we'd spots. have to probably think a little bit about funding because like the 15 to right. 20 was kind of trying to support but if we opened it up and said anybody with an interest is welcome mm -hmm. um <laughs> i think we'd go past that fifty thousand dollar limit yeah <laughs> uh, 
up pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at you, Richard, coming in from New Zealand, you'd eat half the... <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. like <laughs> There's, yeah. We could also, we could open it up, you know, there could be people who are funded and people who self fund their participation yes. as well. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking about in terms of the, the budget and trying to get the maximum amount of people there, like how we could, you know, find a way to allow people to join virtually perhaps, although hybrid events in the past have been the bane of my existence. Maybe, maybe technology has gotten so there, better since I tried. Oh, you're, you're <laughs> correct. There is, there is a, there is a, mo there is a model for this. Mm. Um, the NSF uses for uh, dis, uh, what is called doctoral consortiums at conferences where you have to register and pay a fee, but there are some subset of people who are actually sponsored and paid for by the NSF and then the other. So that's kind of behind the scenes, right? It's not publicized that way. Mm -hmm. There are people who, you know, you apply for it and some people are funded and others who aren't funded, they just know that they know the charge, whatever it will be up front. And uh, that also allows you to recruit people in the background. So if there are folks whom you want to be there, you can offer them funding um, up front. And just, you know, because you want their participation, like pose grantees might, would be probably people who would be funded, right? Um, but this hybrid, this kind, not hybrid conference, but some people pay, some people don't. This is pretty common for ACM mm -hmm. conferences that I go to. Okay. That sounds good. And I well, could help you sort that out because I'm treasurer for a couple of ACM conferences. So I kind of, I know that's, I know that world. <laughs> Yeah, that would be helpful. I would. Richard, you're unmuted. Do you have a comment? Yeah, there's also just um, corporate versus student versus researcher uh, mm -hmm. pricing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Different fee structures. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe then, Sean, if you're willing to help out, I had shared kind of a draft with Allison that we had yes. worked through. And, okay. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll reach out to Allison and Slack to coordinate some, uh, just a logistics conversation separate from this, if that makes sense. Okay, because yeah. folks right. have, have expressed an interest in hosting this workshop, so me as well. <laughs> Give it a go. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a comment, Richard, as well? I think. Yeah, I, I feel like I should mention I'm I'm on a panel next week. Uh, I think your Monday. Okay. Um. Um. From posts, so like. Jeffrey Stanton, the program director, asked me to be on the panel, um, I think with Kendall Fortney, and we're looking for a third person um, okay. to talk about open source stuff to the oh. post award winners. Oh, you're always oh, saying, okay, you're not a... I'm talking. I'm like, I'm like, if you're a reviewer, you're not yeah. supposed to... Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm the, not an I NSF reviewer. Yeah. Um, I'm going to edit that out, but this is different. Okay. No, it's okay. No, my... Yeah, my, my trousers are still very small. Um, but that's kind of cool. So, um, I, I don't know if it's open though. I just know I'm on it and I don't think it's private for me to say that I'm on it. Oh, no, no, I, like, it was yeah, just, cool. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> I'm sure that's all good. Well, that'll be fun. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Is it cool. a all day session or a half day? No, session? it's, I think it's just a, it's, it's an hour. Um, let me see like, if I can find out more about it because I hadn't thought about linking it cause I thought it was kind of. Just a post thing. It's just since it came out, it's like an hour. Okay, that's cool. All right, cool. Uh, this is a great discussion. We're at the end of things. I just do want to remind people that there is, if you haven't seen this Open Forum Academy call in Boston, at, in Harvard. So I would recommend that you take a look at this link. And I, I actually saw something that had come across as well. So, you know, Wikisim, OpenSim. The conference is that still around no they actually they are <laughs> shutting down open sim and they pointed everybody to this by saying interesting yeah we're not doing open sim anymore but go check this out so there could be a really interesting group of people there i'm thinking just so i yeah. would recommend that you do take yeah. a look at this i i went last year i just dropped i i did a blog post about um about the event last year i went to the one in berlin and it was yeah it was an interesting mix of sort of policy, practitioner, research. Um, it was it was a good event. And it's a um, 
it's a 400 word submission, like an abstract. Which, so it's really easy to just get your ideas in as a submission. So I do recommend you take a look at that. Um, and then just so you know, member summit, which is a, you know, you can, you can, it's a funny conference because it's invite only kind of sort of thing. Uh, but I think anybody can submit. And if you do get it. Yeah. That's the way you can get an invite is by yeah. getting a talk accepted. <laughs> so, um, and it's in Napa this year. It's always in a very convenient place to the, <laughs> to the <laughs> convenient to the Silicon Valley anyway. Yeah. <laughs> convenient to no one where there's no big airports. Yes. Okay. Same thing with Tahoe. Ugh. Exactly. Well, I love Tahoe because I ski, but <laughs> but just so hard to get to. It is. <laughs> uh, All right. Well, thank you, everybody. It's it's great to see everybody, and hopefully the Ospo for Good thing is going off pretty well. So keep following your friends on that as well. So I'm having some serious FOMO this week after watching all the stuff on Twitter and everything. Yeah, amazing. I'm wishing I'd gone. The room looks amazing. You see the room where they're all in? Yes. I just keep seeing. Yeah, it's the UN. It's a big room. No, it's a UN room. I'm like, how cool <laughs> to be giving a talk there. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Super well. cool. But they all have to deal with New York. New York in the summer is awful. The heat, the smell. Just just imagine getting on the subway. You know, it makes it better for me. It makes it better. Okay. Fair enough. I was I'm there last week. You don't wanna you don't wanna be there right now. It's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> well then excellent. We can all just sit there. <laughs> all right. Thanks everybody. Till next time. Bye everybody. Thanks. Bye.